Welcome to the final part of our heritage talk, Saved from Extinction, exploring how archaeology is saving our aviation heritage. The final part discusses the fairy Barracuda. Now, being a dive bomber, the aircraft was fitted with dive flaps or air brakes, the Youngman flaps, and these helped um, during carrier landings, reducing the likelihood of coming in, I think the expression may be too hot and overshooting. Um, uh, applying the air brakes at relatively high speed, whilst also applying the rudder, however, could throw the aircraft into a very dangerous inverted dive. I don't fly, but even to me, that sounds dangerous. Um, this was a particular danger for inexperienced pilots who didn't know the aircraft's little peculiarities. And several accidents occurred during practice practice flights before the problem was identified. But still, the aircraft was never a favorite of the inexperienced. And it was also linked to a high number of unexplained crashes, usually involving inexperienced pilots. Eventually, during 1945, the cause was traced to small leaks that developed in the hydraulic fluid control systems. Most commonly, unfortunately for the pilot, in his pressure gauge and what would happen is that this fault would occur and the leaking gauge would spray hydraulic fluid straight into the pilot's face unpleasant enough but particularly serious because hydraulic fluid also contained ether and as few of the pilots um, used oxygen masks below 10,000 feet or use them anyway, the pilot who suffered that misfortune would become unconscious extremely quickly and the aircraft would then inevitably crash. And these problems and the Barracuda's occasionally rather clumsy flying qualities, uh, particularly in the hands of the inexperienced, inspired mirth as well as concern. And this was reflected in the jokes that those who did not fly the aircraft told. It was said, this is a really old and corny one, that it was a flying prostitute because it had no visible means of support. I'm sure that's been said a lot, uh, a, a lot of uh, military aircraft. It was also said about uh, it that Although the Barracuda is a wonderful invention, it will never take the place of an aircraft. Now, mess songs were sung about it, including this ditty to the tune of You Must Remember This from the 1942 film Casablanca. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to try and sing it, but if you can imagine, if you don't know the film, it goes something like this. You must remember this, a barra's poor as, and I'll miss that mess room language out. On that, you can rely, no matter what the future brings, it will not fly. Those in the military who get to use kit that has a certain reputation are often the first to send it up. Barracuda pilots, the butt of their comrades' humour, were typical and invented the following song. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember the tune of any old iron will know that this is any old eye, any old eye, any, any, any old eye, and down at Lee, you get them free, built by ferries for a crew of three, bags of fun, no front gun, an engine you can't rely on. You know what you can do with your Barracuda too? Old iron, old iron. And yet, despite this sending up, and all the problems that the Barracuda could bring to an inexperienced pilot. Like its predecessor, the Swordfish, it turned out to be an effective aircraft. Too late for serious action in the Med, northern latitudes, it was just the aircraft that the Royal Navy needed. Barracudas carry out devastating attacks on German convoys off Norway. In April 1944, 42 aircraft launched from the carriers Victorious and Furious dive bombed the very heavily defended German battleship you can see here, the notorious Tirpitz, hitting it with 14 bombs and putting it out of the war for two months. 
in the Far East, despite its uh, asthmatic engines, it was almost the right aircraft. Despite flying, having to fly over high mountains, it still managed to achieve success against targets in the East Indies. It then served quietly, mainly as a trainer, well into the 50s. Whilst it may not have been a great or a beautiful aircraft, never let anyone tell you that the Barracuda didn't earn its spurts. Okay, it's a furry Barracuda, but which Barracuda? When was it lost? Was anyone lost with it? Well, a serial number for the engine was found, you'll see, says Merlin. And the Rolls-Royce Heritage Center kindly confirmed that it was built in Derby between September and December 1943. So our aircraft was lost no earlier than September 1943. Now, the aircraft is just off the end of the runway of the former HMS Daedalus at Leon Solo. This was an extremely important fleet air arm base that originated back to the First World War. And plenty of barracudas are known, are known to have flown from there. It's overwhelmingly likely, therefore, that the aircraft was based at Daedalus. Now, remember I said about the unborn arrestor hook. Well, that indicated that it was a fairly new aircraft. Now, two Daedalus Barracudas are recorded as having been lost near the airfield around about that time. Both were fairly new. Number BV739 was lost in September 1943 when it lost power during takeoff and crashed in shallow water. However, this is uncomfortably close to the earliest date of manufacture of the engine. Furthermore, this aircraft was made by Bolton Corp under license, whereas the manufacturer's marks and tags on other indications on the wreck suggested that it had been built by Ferries. An LS-473 is a better fit. Also lost on takeoff, but in January 1944, this aircraft had been built by Furries and had been delivered the previous November. The wreck had an internal paint scheme that was also characteristic of Furries, as I've said. So also, this aircraft was also recorded as carrying a torpedo when lost. LS-473 is recorded to have ditched, and ditching with a torpedo was not a wise thing to do. And an urgent action that the pilot would have taken as soon as he realized he was in trouble, were to ditch the torpedo. No torpedo has been found with the wreck, but a torpedo retaining cable was found. This was normally taken off the aircraft if a torpedo wasn't being carried because it could whip around and cause damage. Now, LS-473 was being piloted by this man, Sub-Lieutenant Sundays. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. If anybody can tell me, please let me know. And he was a member of the RNVR. And he's recorded in his squadron log as having had to swim two miles back to shore, which, if you know the Solent and its strong tides and the coldness of the water at that time of year, you will know would not have been a moon feat at all. And it is perhaps the reason why parts of a flying boot and a jumper were found in the aircraft, possibly uh, ditched before he jumped into the water. And why at least one of the perspex windows of the aircraft, you remember I mentioned that before, uh, appeared to have been deliberately popped out. I'm glad to be able to tell you that um, the sub-lieutenant survived. However, whilst his aircraft is currently the lead candidate, unfortunately, records of Barracuda losses are incomplete. And there, as far as I'm aware, is still no proof that his was the aircraft that we found. Perhaps a combination of serial numbers will eventually provide the proof. In the meantime, 
the flying boot is marked size 12 and the sub-lieutenant's son who lives in Canada has been contacted about his father's shoe size. Now that is not quite the end of the story because the question is why were the Fleet Air Arm Museum involved and what is the significance of this discovery and its recovery? Well, I can tell you this, the Barracuda, like very many of our historic aircraft, became extinct. In other words, it did not survive in use or preservation or even as the gate guards you sometimes still see outside of airfields. And because of this, the Fleet Air Arm Museum have had a very long running aim to rebuild a furry barracuda from wreck parts. And this aim was instigated all the way back in, I think it's the 1970s, and I'm I have to check that, but I think it was the 1970s, not perhaps the 80s, when um, a furry barracuda or parts of one um, were recovered from a lock in Northern Ireland. And that aircraft had crashed in August 1944, sadly with the loss of all three crew. And in total now, the Fleet Aero Museum have parts from four barracudas plus other miscellaneous parts and are starting to try to reassemble one. Now, unfortunately, no detailed manufacturing and assembly drawings exist. So parts are rather difficult to uh, make from scratch uh, or to replicate replacement parts, which is where the furry barracuda that was recovered by IFA-2 is playing its part because this aircraft was less heavily distorted uh, by its crash than aircraft that crash on land tend to be. And therefore, you're getting a lot of parts, or the Fleet Air Arms here, you're getting a lot of parts from this aircraft that are in a pretty good condition and in even better condition once they have been conserved by the Fleet Air Arm Museum. Who would believe that that object up there after conservation now looks like that? And if I show you this, that is on the right. That is not a new parts bin. That are part, those are parts that have been recovered from this aircraft wreck and cleaned up. Now, I have to say to you, that aircraft uh, parts recovered by the sea tend to be rather unstable. We're not entirely sure what uh, the long-term future of them is, but at the moment the signs are good in the fact that they've been returned to some sort of stability, and that is very much down to this man and uh, Will uh, Gibbs um, of the Fleet Aero Museum and his uh, volunteers who have been spending many hours on the project. Just remains for me to finally thank um, my senior colleagues on this project. I was a diver archeologist, wasn't on it for the whole thing. And my colleagues, Ewan, uh, Alistair and Ben were very much uh, my lead colleagues. Uh, also thanks to Will Gibbs and Dave Morris, Fleet IRL Museum. Uh, of course, uh, the IFA2 project, National Grid, uh, Representative Jake Stevens and the marine contractors who put a lot of work in to recovering this really important aircraft, James Fisher. Thank you. Thank you for watching our heritage talk, Saved from Extinction, exploring how archaeology is saving our aviation heritage. Also, thank you to Graham Scott for such an insightful talk. Keep an eye out for future heritage talks across our social media outlets.